Hey guys, this is Alan Fregman for TD Survival, and today I'm going to show you how to create a bike chain rig. Initially, I was just going to show you how to create the chain, the chain itself, but I thought it would be much more interesting if I threw in a couple gears and showed you how you can link everything to the rotation of the main gear and have everything stick and not slide at all. And if I hit play, I have some animation. And as you can see, all of the links are rotating exactly with the rotation of the wheel. They are sliding the exact amount, and all of these small ones are also adjusting. And what's really cool about this particular setup is that I made it scale aware. So as you grab any of these nulls, and if you were to resize it, like scale it down, for example, you can see it's still perfectly lined up. If I make it really small, it'll start spinning really fast. Nonetheless, it's still the right, right amount. If I make it big, it'll be nice and slow. Something like that. See? Perfectly lined up. So these are actually taking the rotation of the big one and adjusting themselves. And the, the chain offset is being driven by the rotation of the big, big controller. So let me show you how to create this. Let's begin. So first of all, you'll need some chain links. Now, I'm not a modeler, I confess, but I, I know a couple shortcuts that I think are going to be great to get this basic shape of the link. As you can see, the common theme between all of these pictures is that links are basically two, two circles that are sort of connected in the middle. And there's two types of links. There's the big one and a smaller one that fits inside the big one. Simple as that and they're always the same distance apart on both parts. So let's see how we can do this really quickly with the general modeling tools in Softimage. So I'm going to go get primitive polygon mesh disk. Uh, where is it? There it is. And this there's going to be a lot of links, so you don't want to go too high res, and they're pretty small anyways. I'm going to go with 12 divisions in U, and I definitely don't need that many in uh, V. So. I, I like to go with whole units. It makes the, the math a little easier. So I'm going to go with an outer of maybe two, two units and an inner of like 0.75. Yeah, that looks about right. And let's move this over here so you can see it better. And I'm going to grab this disk and I shall duplicate it. And I'm going to hold, make sure my snapping is set to grid and hold down control and Slide it to the side, slide my copy to the side. So now I have two. And when I grab the two, I will go ahead and go to the modeling section and polygon mesh merge. And I will crank up the tolerance. And look at that. It connects the middle, which is very, very similar to the kind of shape that we're after. I'm going to grab the middle row and scale it out a bit. I'm going to hold down control so it's I think it's a multiple of two, I think. So it's a little bit bigger. And look at that. We all, we already have the basic shape. I'm going to go here and click delete. So it deletes the original disks. Now I have one shape. And I need to give this thickness. So I'm going to press U for the Raycast polygon selection. Do Control A to select all my polygons. Then Control D to extrude. And I, yeah, I can just translate the polygons up. Actually, I, I, I like, I prefer to use the, the slider and the extrude so you can do it by an exact amount. Let's do like 0.25. And then I'm going to go in my polygon mesh over here under modify, actually, and do symmetrize. Where is it? There it is. Symmetrize. Make sure the, the reference is local. And I'll do it on the y axis, of course. And now I have thickness. And the center is pretty much in the middle, so I can scale it up a bit if I want it to be a little bit thicker. For now, I think this will do fine. I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this piece and hold down Control and translate it down. And I will duplicate it yet again. And, oops, I, there we go, move it up. I move the middle piece right in between the other two, like a little sandwich. And I will scale this one up a little bit, and I will make sure I delete these loops, actually. I don't really want them. 
they add more density for no reason. Let's delete those. Uh, um, if you don't know how to grab a loop, I'm selecting one edge, then holding down con the Alt key, and then middle clicking on the next one, and it grabs the loop. I think in uh, 2012 or 2013, you can just double click on the edge. I don't think this works in 2011. Um, now, just want to grab the this loop of polygons on the on the outside, and uh, go ahead and do a deform push under the animate section. Deform push. There we go, and push them in a bit. And this will just give an interesting shape. So it's as if it's a little bit smaller. And I'll just change the size, make sure they touch the top and bottom. And this looks good. So I'm going to go ahead and freeze my translations, actually my all my transforms, and freeze modeling. And I will go ahead and merge these, because I want them to be one piece. Merge, I'll make sure my tolerance is none. Hit delete here. And now I have my little uh, chain link sandwich. Now I just need to make sure that the center is in the actual middle. So I'm going to go here in the center button, the center editing mode, hold down control and move down a bit. Make sure my other piece has the same height as well. Now they both have the same center. And if you did it right, the center of the object should be in the first hole. And in this case, if you followed along, uh, I, these are, um, believe four units apart. Let's, let's count to be safe. One, two, three, four. Yeah. Four units apart. You can always count with a null too. Just make a null, move it where you need it and look down here Four units. So we know that this, this chain link that we have here is four units apart, hole to hole. This will be important later on. So let's say we're seen. So in the interest of time, I went ahead and drew this curve. I just went to create curve, draw cubic by CVs, and I clicked around. And you just basically want a big shape and a slightly smaller, smaller shape. So let's go ahead. So first, first problem. How do I get something on this? So I, I can make a null to just to explain my point and do curve path under the constraint menu and click your curve. And this will give you something that will slide around. Now you notice that when I slide around, the, the limits are from zero to a hundred. So I, I need to figure, figure out a way to go beyond this limit. I will show you a way. But first of all, let's prepare our, our pieces. Initially, so we, you just need to figure out how, how big we need this to be. And I'm just going to rotate these pieces so I can see them facing me because I drew the curve from the right, the right view. And obviously this is a very big piece. So I think I'm going to scale it down by 0.5. This is still a little bit big, but I just want to be able to see it for the sake of the tutorial. So how many links do we need? How do we figure that out? It's actually pretty simple. You go get your curve. You have to figure out the length of the curve. So you go shift enter with your curve selected and it will provide you the length over here. It is in this case, 88.02. So let's just say 88, although I'm going to grab the exact value to be safe. And I will go to the script editor to do some simple math. I'm just going to type here just for a shortcut log equals application dot log message. So I don't want to spend half the tutorial typing and we shall do log open brackets and close brackets. And in between those, we'll put the length and how, how many divisions. So we need to know the, the size of our link. So we know that it's four units apart. So it's four units, but hold on a second. It was four units apart when it was in, in the original shape. Now it's been scaled down by 0.5. So it's actually two, but just to show you the math, I'm going to go four multiplied by 0.5. And the result of this will be how many links we need. So we need 44.1 links. We're not going to make 0.1 links. So we'll round it up to 44. So now that we know we need 44 links, we can go ahead and prepare our pieces. I'm going to open up the Explorer and always remember to name your things. 
I it seems I've forgotten. So I'm gonna call this uh, chain curve. And this uh, is important. I'm gonna call it something and then zero and the same thing on the other one and then a one. This way when I duplicate it, it will always alternate. And that's exactly what we want because you want the small one and the big one, the small one and the big one. But before we can start duplicating, we need to create a couple parameters that will be required for the the constraint setup that I'm going to show you. I'll explain why exactly we need them in a little bit, but just follow along. I'm going to go create parameter, new custom parameter set. I'm going to call this one setup. You can call it whatever you want as long as you're consistent. And I'll select the setup property. It has no parameters inside yet. I'm going to do shift P for parameter. And inside I'm going to type in... I'm going to call this one perk for percentage and do 0 to 100 in the limits. Press OK. Cool. I have my percentage slider. I'm going to do Shift P again. Make sure it's still selected. And I will do the same. I'll call it offset. And I'll make sure the range is really ridiculous. So just throw in a lot of zeros. Go nuts. And then press OK. And now we have our percentage and the slider that goes into crazy crazy big values. And we will do the same thing for the other link, but it's a lot easier to just copy and paste. So I'm gonna drag this over to the other one. You'll notice if I do this, it's just gonna move it from one to the other. But if you, I'm gonna undo that. And if you hold down control, the control key when you're dragging, it will actually copy. And just a good little tip. So now I have the exact same property in both. And this is ready to be duplicated. I'm going to go ahead and do it by hand. Good old fashioned manual way. And you'll notice that the, the initial number was zero. So we need to stop at, we said it was 44, so we need to stop at 43. So I went too far. So I'm going to go ahead and delete these last two. And now that I have these, I'm going to grab them all and do constraint path, curve path, pick my curve. And just to show you what this looks like uh, as, as soon as you apply it, you can do uh, a little trick here in the parameters. You can do L open bracket 0, 100. And what that does, it's a linear distribution between the two values you give it. So 0 to 100 because it's a percentage. Press enter and it's going to spread them out. Now you notice that I haven't turned on tangency yet, so the orientation is all flat. That's not good. So let's turn that on. I accidentally selected one of them, so I need to select them again. Turn on tangency. And I'm also going to turn on the up vector. And I guess it seems I need to change the axis. I'm going to go with Z. That seems to work. I will explain uh, how to set the up vector a little bit later. We're going to leave it at the default for now. Now, obviously, it's very cumbersome to go ahead and increment each one. So you need to have some kind of setup. First of all, we have our um, our slider here, percentage. Let's see what happens when we link that. So I'm going to do it in the first link. I'm going to hide the other ones to make it a little bit easier to see. There we go. And let's open the constraint for this one lock that window and let's open the property for it lock that too and i'm going to drag the perk into the into the percentage and you see it it's uh, it just linked it straight pretty basic not quite useful yet but you'll notice when you linked it 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 says link zero this explicit naming is not great because then you can't really copy and paste the expression to other things and you're going to want to make it as abstract as possible so you can copy and paste and reuse this in the future. So I'm going to go ahead and change this to this, which actually gets replaced with the current object. So this way I can copy and paste later. Hit validate and apply. Now it's still not useful because I cannot go beyond the amount that I want. So let's see what happens. I need to add the offset. And... This might work, or might not. 
Now it's working and it's actually allowing you to inc put a, per a percentage bigger than, than it should be allowed. But I don't really trust this. I don't know if it's a bug. I don't know if it's going to work in future versions. So I'm going to show you how you would do it if this was hard limited at 100, just so you know. So the way to do this is it's invo it involves a mathematical operation called modulo or modulus. All it is, it's, it sounds, it's just a fancy name for dividing a number by a particular number and then getting the remainder of that. What that means is you divide, say, if I do the modulo of my full operation here and then divide that by 100, then I will get, say the, say the result was 150 and I divide it by, I do the modulo of that for, with a divisor of 100, then I'm going to get 50 because it went over the limit and I got the remainder. So that's basically all there is to it. In the expressions, we have this as a function. You can see it over here. I think it's under conditions. No, sorry. Uh, it's under value. There it is. Value modulo. And it tells me here, oops, it uh, put it right after my text. It's actually f mod, I guess for modulo function, value one, value two. So what that means is how I will grab this and I'll divide it by value two and I'll get the remainder of that. So in our case, we want to grab the whole operation. So I'm going to put f mod at the, in the front, open brackets, my percentage and my offset, and then a hundred. And this way, Every time that I go over 100 with my offset, you'll see how, how it's going, um, giving me a value between 0 to 100. So say I put 150, I get 50. Say I put 180, I get 80. Because as soon as, you know, or if I do 220, I get 20. Because as soon as it goes over the limit of the divisor, I'm just getting the remainder. This way it sort of resets, so to speak. And this way you know that in the future, if... If it turned out that the percentage going above 100 was actually a bug, then you're still safe. So now that we know this, we know that we can do this for all of them, and this way we can have an offset that's common between them and can slide them all at the same time infinitely. So let's do that. I'm going to right-click in here and copy animation, which copies the source, which is an expression in this case. And looks down here. Yeah, it's, it's up to date. Good. I'm going to select my other links. I'm going to unlock this first, actually. Unlock this window. Select my other links. And I'm going to right click in my path and paste animation. This will paste the same thing on all the other ones. And because I use the word this, it will, it's reusable. So each one is only referencing its own property, which is why it's important that we made these properties first. And now we can actually grab all of them, open up their common property and play with the offset. And let me unhide them for you first so you can actually see them. And of course now they're all overlapping the same space. That's not good. So we're going to go to our setup. Actually, we're going to go to selection so I get all of them in the multi-selection. And we'll do the same trick with the linear distribution. L open bracket, 0 comma 100, close bracket, press enter. They're all distributed. And so this way we treat the percentage, the first slider, as a sort of a static initial location, location or initial placement. And then we take the offset and we use that to move, move it around. This way you can always redistribute your whole thing. And you can always offset regardless if you wish to change the number of links later or anything like that. Now, of course, you, you need to grab all of them and move the offset. That's a little bit awkward. So we're going to need to um, make a controller. So let's make a, a null. Make it a sphere. Actually, I call it a sphere. It's uh, rings. I'm going to turn off the null shape. And let's scale. Let's resize this. Say 10. Actually, let's do 7. Yeah, seven's okay. And I'm going to just squeeze it on the x-axis by scaling it down over here. Say like 0 
And so you can see it better. I'm going to go make a display property and set the wireframe to bright green. There we go. So this does nothing right now, but we'll make it work. First, let's rename this controller. And I'm going to call this actually um, master driver because I'm going to have other objects that will be master driven and they will be the, the little gears at the end. So let's, let's start like this. I'm going to save my scene again. Always save your work. You never know when it's going to crash. So how do we know how much we need to slide our, value, our values of our offset to move according to the main controller? Well, you need to use a bit of high school math here. If you remember your, your math, it's basically pi r squared. So pi, the constant pi, pi, uh, multiplied by the radius squared. So radius times the radius. And it's a pretty simple formula. And you need to understand that's, that's basically giving you the circumference of a circle. So you have your, your controller, which is a circle. And the circumference is the the length around the circle. So let's say that it was say that the circle was disconnected and it was a piece of string. If I was to extend it, that would be my cir my circumference of a circle, how long it is around it. So to calculate that, we need the radius. The radius is the you should know this, but the radius is the the length from the center to the outside and the diameter is that times two it's from both sides and when you multiply your diameter by pi you get the the circumference of a circle so you know how long this circle actually is if it was extended in a line and to associate this we basically need to understand that the rotation of the controller is pi r squared divided by 360 because there's 360 degrees in one full rotation. So this way we know that when we move one degree, it's going to move the right fraction of length of our curve in order to slide perfectly in sync with our controller. So to do that, it's pretty simple. I'm going to go grab my, my controller. And because I want this to be more straightforward, I'm not going to do the, a big formula for every single link because that would be a waste of CPU resources. So what I will do is I'll make a new parameter set, call it setup as well, just to be consistent. And I'm going to call this, I, mean, I, I selected it, press shift P to make a new parameter, call this slide and make it very, very long. Again, a very big range. So it's almost infinite. And there we go, and here I'll, I'll do my formula. So I'm going to take Control-K to get my kinematics. Gives you the local kinematics of your selection, which is our driver. And we want to rotate this on the x-axis. So I start by dragging my x-axis into the slide. And here we have our formula, master driver, kini local dot x. So as I was telling you before, you need to multiply this by the pi r squared formula which all it means is your radius. So if I lock these, make sure these windows are locked, I press enter, I get my null. And my null has a size. Size is actually the radius in the case of a ring shape. It's actually the radius right here, which is seven. And I can drag this in. And just to like, it, like before, I'm gonna rename this to this. So it's not explicitly named. I can reuse this expression later on. Same thing for the front part. So I'm going to get my size, if you remember, pi r squared, so radius times 2, or squared, so radius times itself. So I'm going to do radius times 2. And then we're going to grab pi, and the expression editor actually has the pi constant right here. It's pi in capital letters. So I'm going to multiply by pi, and always watch out with your brackets, make sure you're, you're wrapping all of your statements correctly with the right amount of brackets, otherwise it's going to complain later. And as I was saying before, we need to divide by 360. This way we get how much we need to slide for just one degree. 
And when we multiply this by our rotation, it will give us the exact amount we need to slide our curve by. I'm going to hit validate. It tells me it's a valid expression. Then you hit apply. Close this. And now when I rotate my wheel, I get the right amount that I need to slide my, my curve with. So now I can grab all my links, open the selection, open the property, and you can see there's no value here because it's different throughout all of the things. But here in offset, it's all zero. So I'm going to slide the, the slide the slide parameter in. And that will just make a very simple one-to-one -one expression. And now, when I rotate this, oh, looks like I only did it to the first one. Let's try that again. Yeah, it looks like I only did it to the first one. So I'm going to right-click, copy animation, make sure I select them all. Right-click, paste animation. I think that did it. There you go. Oh, and it seems to be going backwards. If you get this problem, two ways, two ways you can do it. You could flip this. You could put a negative value in there. Or I think it's much, much simpler. You select your curve and go into the, modeling, the modeling tools. And then to modify curve, you invert direction by doing the inverse. That way, it basically flips it around. And now it's the right orientation. And it makes the formulas a lot simpler to to follow. So there we go. Now we now this is rotating correctly. However, I only considered the size. So when I scale this down, it's not quite right. As you can see, if you look closely at the the plus sign, it's actually sliding. That's not good. So how do I fix this? Well, you go back to your expression, and this is why it's great to to do it all in one parameter because all of these are linking to this parameter and it's very easy to adjust. So I'm gonna to go to the expression editor again. And I was just reading the size, but that's not enough because when I scale it, the size still looks the same and then you get the wrong value. So I need to make another bracket level yet again. It's bracket madness here. <laughs> and multiply my size by the global scaling. Now you could do all of the scaling axes if you want to. I, I'm just going to go with one of them because let's face it, when you scale something, you scale all of the, all of the, all of the axes at the same time. So I'm going to multiply by this kini for kinematics dot global. Oops, not global, global dot scale X, S C L X. Could be Y or could be Z. I'm going to go with X. I'm going to validate this again. Still good. If your brackets are bad, <laughs> it won't say that. So make sure your brackets are good. Press apply. And then I'm just going to make this wider so you can see it in the video. If you need to pause and check this out. Then I'm going to close this. And now, same thing. But now when I scale it, watch this. Oh, look at that. See that? It's not sliding anymore. And if I make this big again, it's all good. So that's, that's basically that feature that's done. Excellent. Let's move on. Let's save our scene yet again. So uh, one thing I'm going to show you real quick is that you're probably seeing this in a video right now. It's, it's hard to follow when they're going fast, especially. So one cool trick to do this is if you color them, I'm going to go ahead and make two materials, one for the first one. I'm going to go with a fong something simple. I'll make this like yellowish. Kind of, yeah, yellow. And I'll make the second one something else. Yeah, maybe, maybe green. Actually, no green. Let's go with uh, red. So now you could randomly apply the, these materials to, to the different pieces, but I'll show you a really cool trick. Let's select them all first open up our trusty script editor and I'm going to make a new tab and I'm going to make sure it's set to Python up here. And I'm going to do import random and random is a, mod a factory module in Python. It's been there forever and it has a really cool feature, a really cool method called random.sample. Sample is the method. 
And it's very simple to use. What it does is it takes a collection, so like a list of items, for example, and it it selects a portion of that, a number of items from that collection randomly, which is perfect what we need. So I'm going to do cell equals application.selection. This will be my selection, so my list of objects. And my sample, I'm going to do sample equals and type in here cell for the collection. And of course, I want to make this easy, so we need to get half of it. So to get half of it, we can do cell.count to get the total, divide that by 2. Notice I didn't do 2.0, because that would be a float, and we want an integer. So just a plain 2. And that will give us the sample, and that's just stored in a variable, so I need to select it. So just do application dot select obj for object. Oops, not obk, obj. And give that the sample variable. And this should run just fine. Watch. Perfect. See that? So I got a random selection of objects. And I'm going to grab these, make a group. And what I'll do, just to make it easier, I'll grab all of the, all of them except the first one, give them all the same first material. And I'm going to grab the members of the group by right-clicking and going Select Members. And I will pick the material from the second one. Same material, link one. Mm. Come on. Okay, it seems like we, we lost our material somehow. Or maybe we need to pick it. Let's try that again. Right-click, Select Members. I'm going to go to the Materials. I always use the hotkey. It's M. And material, assign material, material one. There we go. For some reason, it wasn't liking picking the material from the object. It usually works. Anyhow, now you see there's a couple of random pieces that got colored. So now, look at that. It's way, way easier to follow along what the pieces are doing. And in, a, in an actual production rig, this is very important to have so that your animators are not complaining that they they're don't know if their they're bicycle is sliding. <laughs> And also, I don't know if you realize this, but this setup pretty much works for a, a tank tread as well. If, if these was just a little bit wider, you pretty much got yourself a tank. Watch. See that? Look, it's almost a tank now. Ooh. It's practically a tank. Now for the last trick, I'm going to duplicate my controller. And I will give it a different color. I'm going to, again, go to the display options of it. Change this to a pink, just to be consistent with my previous choice. Say light pink so it doesn't burn my eyes or yours. Actually, that's a little hard to see. Let's go with another color. Blue. Blue is good. Dark blue. And I'm going to go ahead and remove the property that, that I have on this object. I'm not going to need it. So I just select it from the selection menu and delete it. And I'm going to rename these to master driven, just to keep track. Not driven, driven. And I'm going to make this kind of fit in the last little bit. There we go. Something like that. Perfect. And now how do I get this to follow along with the main wheel? Now you, you obviously you can't make the chain follow two links. There needs to be a main a main one, that's the driver, and the, the small one needs to follow. So to do that, in fact, the easiest way is to proportionally rotate the, the, the driven ones by the relative amount of the big one. So what that means is you find the percentage difference between the two, and you, you take the master rotation from your main one, and you multiply it by your your fraction of difference. So what that looks like <laughs> is if you do control K and we're going to rotate on the X, of course. So I'm going to right click on the X and go expression editor. And I'm going to make sure I lock this window so it doesn't go away. And I select my master, do control K again. And as we know, it's still the X rotation. So I'm going to drag my X in. I'm not going to rename it because it's a different object, of course, because it's going into this one. And what I'll do is I'll multiply it. And to get the difference, all I have to do 
is just multiply by my size of my master. So master driver dot null dot size divided by my current size, which will be of course this dot null dot size. Now you think this is probably done, but <laughs> Uh, you need to, of course, consider the scale. So we're going to make this a little bit more long and grab our size and multiply it by its own uh, scales. So yet again, master driver dot kinney dot global dot SCLX scale. And then make sure my close my brackets and I make another bracket level over here. Take my this null dot size and multiply it by this not nulled because it's a kinematics so this kinney dot global dot scl x and close my brackets this should still be valid yep and now as i rotate this you see how let me close this as i rotate the main main one you see how the the small one is following perfectly there you go that's all there is to it and i can go ahead now that i have one one nice setup and duplicate it. Oops. I'm going to do control alt D to duplicate without the funny offsets that it does. And I want to resize this. And there we go. And you can see the big one is matching perfectly and the small one is matching perfectly. Just as we want. And you could do many of these. You could make these, you could put geo in them. You can make them more interesting and uh, it will look really cool. <laughs> So one last step before you finish the setup is to make sure your up vectors are right. Because if you want to rotate this as a, as a whole rig, as let's say I put a, a main control, which will grab everything. So I'm going to grab all my links, put them in there, grab my other things. If I was to rotate this, it's going to mess up. See that? That's really ugly. You don't want that. Same thing with the, actually, no, the other rotation is okay, but the Z is messed up. To fix that, it just means you need an up vector because it's taking, if you remember from before, oh yeah, also looks like I didn't freeze my modeling on my pieces. Let's do that real quick. Grab them all, freeze them, boom. So if you remember from before, I told you to go into the constraint and in the up vector, up vector we just left it at Z. So it's just facing Z, which means it's facing forwards, as we know from down here in the little, little gimbal or axis, axis indicator. So when you go sideways, what's going on is that it's sort of looking to the, the middle in the Z, Z direction, and that's messing it up. So what you need to do is you need to have enough vector as a child of your main sort of control so I'm going to go ahead and make another null. I'm going to call it up vector. And I'm going to place it in the middle. Now you're lucky that with uh, something like a bike chain or a tank tread, the everything is usually facing the middle in some way or another. So I'm going to go ahead and select all my pieces, open my constraint from the multiple selection section, and go to the up vector tab, go pick new to pick my new up vector and I'm going to pick it in the explorer just to be safe. And there we go. Now, if I put my up vector as a child of the main control, when I twist it, Ooh, look at that. Now I won't flip. If I, if I move it around, it'll be okay. As long as your up vector moves with it, you can see what happens if I move the up vector basically flips around, which is kind of cool. You know, you might want that. <laughs> but uh, not another with a bike chain. Oh yeah, one little note that I forgot to mention. Right now, if you try to translate a link, it will let you, that's not cool. And that's because you need to go to your constraint and make sure that under the first tab, lock path, lock to path on interaction is turned on. So make sure you grab all your links and turn that on. I forgot to mention that earlier and on, that's all. So there you go, that's it. You have a bike chain. And of course, like I said before, you can scale these out and you pretty much got yourself a tank.
And that is all. I hope you learned something. I hope you learned how to apply the good old pi r squared formula to good use. And I hope to see you again. Have a great day. Bye.